hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Nice beard right there. I like it. Looking good. Um, hey, there's been a lot of really great things going on over the last couple of weeks, and I got a couple of pictures off my computer so I could show you guys a few things that are happening. First, um, um, yes. I don't know if you guys know, but Leighton Van Der Esch got selected. I mean, he went straight from a really storied um, program to another really storied program, and I'm just really thankful for that. Um, no, in all seriousness, let's go to the next one. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, this is my screensaver on my computer. I have some pictures. Can you guys get to the other ones that are going on? I just think it's important that, that we just recognize that Boise State and the pipeline to the Dallas Cowboys, it's just like a God thing. You've got to celebrate everything that God does, whether it's big, little. This is a big deal for me personally. Can I just enjoy it for just a little bit, okay? I'm not trying to say, you know, be, you know, too, I know the Cowboys can be hated, but come on, what we're doing here in our community to connect, we just got to keep, just feel the love, okay? Cedric Wilson, you know, Orlando Skandrick, you know, I could go on for a really long time because there's so many of them, okay? Tyrone Crawford, Marcus, you know, Lawrence and stuff. So Kellen Moore's there. Anyways, um, there's really actually some things going on in church that I want to celebrate as well. Uh, and that is Love Week. We had almost 1,000 people volunteer and serve uh, throughout the last couple of weeks. Some projects even went into this week or had more to do and went and served. And so it's great to see almost 1,000 people out doing that between Feed My Starving Children and everything. So just can you put your hands together for something that we desire to see in our church? Giving, loving, and serving, not just in our church, but outside into the community. Also, getting the chance to see a thousand students come out uh, at a gathering called United Night last weekend was really great. Uh, kids making decisions for Christ, taking their next step. Yeah. With God. Last weekend, 12 baptisms, one in every couple in every service. It's great to see, hey, I've surrendered my life to Christ. I'm taking that next step. Here's the story, the journey that God has me on, and to be able to celebrate with people. And each and every week, we'd love to do a baptism every week. Um, we do them about once a month because we put kind of groups together and all that. And, uh, you know, run the hose, fill the tank, and then just celebrate what God has done. Um, I mentioned a little bit last week in a couple of the services, but one thing um, as a church— we're big on discipleship, which means taking that next step in our loving and leading. We want to honor God with our time, with our talent, with our treasure. And to see the financial uh, commitment that's being made, the sacrificial giving by Rock Harbor, thank you guys. Thank you for taking that step. We don't pass an offering basket. We don't try to, you know, strong arm people like, hey, you need to do this or the kids aren't going to have goldfish in the classroom. You just say, hey... Here's the need. As we follow Jesus, we want to give first and foremost, uh, as he commands, give to his church. And that's what we do to resource the gospel in our community and around the world. So thank you for doing that and stepping into discipleship. And lots of great things to celebrate. And if you're new to Rock Harbor, I want to share kind of how we study the Bible and what our process looks like. And so we go through books of the Bible one at a time, and we've done quite a few books since we started. Uh, last year we did Galatians, which is set free. This is, by the way, all online on our website. So if you want to get caught up or you want to revisit something, these are always available. Our media team does such a great job and video team with it. Uh, we did Galatians last year. We did Strong and Courageous Study Through Joshua for about 20 weeks. Um, Loveology, that was a study on... Uh, on relationships. Guys, you're going to want your wife and you guys get to get together and restudy that again. So it's a really good uh, study through the book of Song of Solomon. Then we went through John for about 54 weeks it took us. And so we broke that up and studied through the entire gospel of John. We just like to work through books of the Bible verse by verse to better understand and, and, and obviously it, to be relevant and say, God, what is it that you have for us? And we study all of it. So even when you get to a part that you're like, ooh, I want to skip that chapter. We don't and we can't because we believe and trust in all of Scripture, and so we'll work through it. And today's going to be a doozy. We'll get to that in a minute. The reason it's going to be a doozy, well, first off, if you came in, you should have got a program when you came in. As part of it, there's some notes, and we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 5. So we studied for about six weeks in 1 Corinthians, then Easter came, then RH for ID, and then now we're back to 1 Corinthians. So chapter 5, if you have your phones, there's also some blanks there that we would love for you to take some notes down 
And uh, there's weekly reading as well. We want what goes on in our services to not just be in this hour and two minutes or hour uh, 61 minute service that we have each week. We want it to carry into groups, into our study outside and into relationships. So we encourage you to, to take notes and, and study a little bit more in it. The reason Paul wrote this letter, letter to the church in Corinth, which he, he planted, so he planted it about 18 months, worked and served and saw people come to Christ, and then he leaves. He's writing a letter back to address some of the behaviors that were going on. See, Corinth was a pretty perverse city. It had two ports. It would be like a modern-day Paris, New York. There was lots coming in, and it was getting a little bit shady. All the behavior, the actions. In fact, one of their temples, it had temple prostitutes, and we're thinking, what has happened? Well, that was what was happening. There was lots of worldviews coming in. It was infiltrating the community. The problem was is it just didn't live in the community. It's found its way into the church. And so what was the sin of the city was now becoming the custom of the church. That's pretty good, okay? It's not good that it happened, but that connected sin, city, custom, church. I worked hard on that, okay? But this is what was going on. And the bad thing was some of the sins that were happening all around were now becoming not addressed in the church. It was just happening. It was like, well, everybody's doing these things. And so Paul's writing this letter to correct this dysfunctional body that exists. And there's kind of an important point. I've shared a couple of times at Rock Harbor, but I want you to hear it again. It's we steer where we stare. We steer where we stare. And what was happening to the church is they were, steer, they were staring at all the things going on in the community, and now they found themselves in the middle of them. See, I like doing messages on relationships or on, you know, on marriage or fun things and people, five steps to a better life and people are like, oh, that was so good. This one is on sexual immorality and church discipline, okay? <laughs> what does that mean? Here we go. First Corinthians 5. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. Okay, so this is the immorality that's taking place. They're saying this relationship, there is a man that has his father's wife. It's not saying he made a bad decision, he drank too much, he slept with his dad's wife, okay? And the reason it says father's wife is it's speaking of a stepmom, okay? Because that was a common term that was used. They didn't use necessarily the word um, stepmom, but he's sleeping, he has his father's wife, meaning they're living together in in the act of this. So this is an open and a continuous sinful lifestyle that's going on. This isn't, hey, made a bad decision. I'm really sorry. I repent. Please forgive me. Come back to, you know, relationship with God and others. Apologize to the family. It was a, I'm going to continue in this sin. Well, word has gotten back to Paul. So this heinous sin that's going on, word's gotten back to Paul to the point that he feels he needs to address it because even the outside world would say, why would someone do this? So keep in mind, it's got to be serious if Paul's going to write a letter about this. The first four chapters, there were some strong and some good things there, but he was a little bit less direct. It's going to get really direct here. And because we study all of the scripture, it's important that if it's in God's word, we need to study it and, and, and look to why is it in there and how can we apply this to our lives. Is sexual immorality, the the Greek word is pornea. So when it says sexual immorality has found its way into the church, it's pornea. And we hear that word, and in our language, we think pornography. And that's where that word comes from. What what pornea is, it's all types of sexuality outside of marriage. So pornea is defined as illicit sexual intercourse. Defined, a couple of examples of it, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, incest, pedophilia, bestiality. And we hear that list, and I read this quickly, and we can go, okay, it's, I mean, we're talking about the perversion of how God designed sex to be. God designed sex for a husband and a wife, not a man and a woman, because it's not, well, we're going to be husband and wife at some point. It's for a husband and for a wife within the context of marriage. So adultery, that's outside the context of marriage. Fornication, that's prior to marriage after, in different relationships. Homosexuality, that's not between a husband and a wife. Incest, pedophilia, bestiality. So God created sex for good and for pleasure. Back to Loveology, Song of Solomon. Encourage you to, to look into that, that series. But also, 
sex is like fire, that when it's in its proper place, it can be good. It's like roasting marshmallows, cooking stuff over the fire. There's like good things that happen, okay? Outside of its proper place, away from the honor and the blessing of what God wants for it, then it creates destruction, danger, and ultimately death, right? And so there's a proper place for this fire. There's a proper place for sex. And the perversion that's being addressed here is a man has his father's wife. And, and before I talk any more about that, I, I don't want this message to be heard like, you know, why is Keith even bringing this up? Okay? We don't live in Arkansas. Like, we don't need to talk about this kind of thing. I say that because I'm from Kansas and I don't want to rip on myself. So... Um, <laughs> I pick a bordered state that just adds two letters to the front of their name, and they're not me. Um, but we have to, when the Bible talks about sexual immorality, it also says that we wouldn't even have a hint of it. There wouldn't even be a glimpse, just a fraction of it, that we need to guard ourselves. And it's not even, sexual immorality is what's being talked about, but actually what Paul's going to get into is everything else, idolatry, worshiping things other than God. And I don't know if you know this, but we have an amazing ability as Americans to worship money. We have an amazing ability to worship the opinions of other people. He talks about revilers, people that are stirring it up. You're confrontational and you're proud of it. You're kind of a jerk and you're, you're glad you are because somebody's got to say something. It got really quiet. Um, <laughs> so don't just hear a man has his father's wife. But Paul is shocked by this to the point that he addresses this in his letter. If he's going to write a lot, I mean, he can't just make it to have a conversation about all of it, but this made the letter, okay? So it's a big deal. I just wonder, like, as we hear about sexual morality that happens in our day and in our time, in our culture, in our lives, are we numb to that? I mean, do we hear that through the lens of right and wrong? Do we hear that through the lens of sinful and not sinful? Do we hear it through the lens of what the Bible has to say, or do we just go... Everybody kind of is doing it. Everybody's addicted to porn. Every, every guy struggles in this way. And every marriage has a few of these kind of things. And, and everybody's kind of living together before they get married. And everybody, or, or, or are we shocked? Paul's shocked by this. But we find ourselves not really being shocked by much anymore and not living as if there's really a standard and there's a very clear one that's been given to us. It doesn't mean we beat people down with it. It doesn't mean we shame people into, that's called self-righteousness, by the way. But what it means is we look at our life and say, have I softened like the very clear word of God and the clear direction that God's given us in his word around even difficult subjects or difficult topics or what is sin and what isn't sin and what is marriage and what isn't marriage and what has sex been designed for and what has it not been designed for? See, God gives us grace. It's displayed by Jesus because in John 8, there was a woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. Can you imagine how humiliating that is? It was almost like these guys got together in a sting operation. It was like a sexual immorality sting operation. And they kind of came in and they, I just wonder where the guy was that was involved. But they, they pulled this girl out and they brought her into the city and then said, Jesus, what would you do? These accusers came to her. And Jesus knelt down in front of them and wrote something in the sand. And one guy walks off, and then he writes something else, and another guy walks off. I just want to know what he wrote. He say, you want to accuse her of this? Let me write your sin. Yeah, you, you've done this. Looks at the next person, you've done this. And then he says, where are your accusers? Because they all bailed. They're trying to judge, they're trying to accuse. And he's like, my grace is sufficient. And in John 8, 11, he says, I do not condemn you, neither do I condemn you. Go from now and sin no more. See, as bad as sexual sin is, it can be forgiven. Did you hear that? As bad as it is, it can be forgiven. Jesus exampled this. So as we hear this, we need to think and hear through the lens of grace. But he also, he gives this compassion. But also, did you notice he gives a command? He doesn't just say, hey, you're forgiven. He says, Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Like, I'm going to give you compassion, but I'm going to command you to change. Meaning, if we confess our sin to Jesus and we say, I am sorry, please forgive me of my sin. He says, go and sin no more. Meaning, turning from the sin 
making an about face to say, I am repenting. Not, thank you for the forgiveness, but we're going to keep looking towards the sin. He said, go and sin no more. He gave us a command to turn. So in your notes there, a couple of your blanks there, it says, first, we all need compassion, period. We all need compassion and grace. We have all fallen short. We need the grace of God. But secondly, we all have a command. We need compassion. We have a command. Andy Stanley says it this way, God is generous with his grace and thorough with his discipline. Generous with his grace, but also thorough with his discipline. So as bad as sexual sin might be, it can still be forgiven. And you know, the Bible talks about the se- a sexual sin, and it explains it in a way that says it's not just a sin against God, but it's a sin against your own body. So sexual activity, whether by God's design or outside of God's design, it is a physical, emotional, mental, and a spiritual act. So if it falls into the immorality realm that we're sinning against, if there's a physical side to it. There's the emotional consequences. It's almost like a sin with double consequences. Because also when we sin against God in it, we're sinning against ourselves and against our bodies, but often other people that are involved. So if it's an extramarital affair, there's other people involved. There's a spouse that's involved where that sin needs to be confessed to that person. And apologies, not just to God, but to that individual. Or with that person in those relationships, there's, there's a riff that's there in this area of sin. Pornography. We may say, hey, pornography, it's just between me and whatever I'm looking at that I just need to confess that to God. Have you thought about the individual lives behind the pornography? You recognize how much of it is involved with sex trafficking? How much of it is marginalized people? And we're going to support that industry. We're going to view that industry. We're going to... I can't even say what I was about to say because I don't know that it's appropriate. as the, the audience that's here because I know we got kids in here. But we need to really look at the way that we have become numb to what is now commonplace and recognize that there's a consequence for this. 1 Corinthians 5, 2 goes on to say, And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who's done these things be removed from among you. He's basically saying, why aren't you grieving and mourning over this sin of a brother? And the sins that you have, is there no mourning? Is there no grieving? They're, they're living in this open and unconfessed sin. Instead, we're like accepting it and celebrating it instead of mourning it and separating from it. We're just saying, all right, everybody kind of does this. For though absent in the body, I'm present in the spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. He's, Paul's saying, hey, I'm not here. I'm not here, but I'm physically, but I'm here in spirit with you. And I'm also held at the same standard as a follower of Jesus, that you too need to call me out. See, when we're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, my spirit's present and the power of the Lord Jesus is with us. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I want to read verse 11 and 13 because it continues. It kind of jumps and then comes back. Verse 11 says, but now, I am, these are strong words, but now I'm writing you. Paul's saying, I'm, this is the second time I've addressed you in this. Now I'm writing you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother, someone who is a proclaimed Christian that's saying, I have given my life to Jesus Christ and is, is participating in this, that we have to be very careful to not associate with them for they're guilty of sexual immorality, greed, or if they're an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, a swindler, to not even eat with such a one. Well, that sounds really harsh. For what have I do Uh, What have I to do with judging others? Is it not the inside the church whom you are to judge? For God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. These are are strong words. So should we judge one another? Well, I would say we shouldn't judge the motives or the ministry of someone else, the things that we can't see or the whys. But what we do need to do is give attention to the behavior and the conduct of one another. And remember, we're talking about those who call themselves professed Christians. This was someone that was a saying, I am a follower of Jesus. I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I'm just happen to be living with and in a relationship with my father's wife. That's why this heinous sin is what's being addressed. This is not some, you know, somebody's got a Rock Harbor sticker on their car and they're not driving good and we just need to tell them that they need to quit sinning, which by the way, would you please stop sinning in that way? 
Like, if you have a Rock Harbor sticker on your car, it doesn't mean that you need to go to them and take them to the elders immediately, but just drive better um, for God's glory. But it's saying that if this is a continual, uh, an open sin, an unconfessed sin, that it needs to be addressed. Behaviors need to be looked at. That's the whole point of love and lead. If we really love one another, we're going to love one another and encourage one another and be advocates for one another, not just be accountability. Like, hey, I'm, I'm waiting for you to mess up. I'm waiting for you to make a bad choice so in the name of Jesus, I can come at you and I can tell you all the things that you're not doing that you should be doing. That in and of itself, if there's an individual or a church that's looking for conflict, they're looking for things to approach people on, then that is wrong. We need to be of grace, but also of truth to say, okay, if we are, are you in a position in your life that someone could talk to you about some shortcomings that you have? Do you have trusted people around you that could say, you know what, I saw how you handled that with your kids and I watched your son's countenance fall. I don't know if you heard, but that came across real strong. Man, sorry, he just never listens. But thanks, thanks for helping me. Not even really realizing that we've fallen into some hint of sin or some piece of anger that we have allowed to take over us. Because it's easy for us to go, hey, not having incest, not doing any of that stuff that's being addressed, I'm probably pretty good. I'm better than most people, rather than looking at even the details of what we should be doing and have we created relationships around us in order to have difficult discussions. Because we're to lead one another, that we should be approachable for one another. See, what you're doing is not godly. So how do we, if somebody is participating in ungodly things, like how do we begin this conversation? How do we talk about this? If, if I am, what's that conversation look like? Are we open to hear the words, hey, would you be willing to turn from this behavior? I'll tell you this, if someone's going to talk to me, and, and people have, I've had conversations. I've been blessed with great friends that will help me to say, what can I do to help you? I can tell you're, you're pretty stressed. Where's this coming from? When you said this, there was more there. I had a conversation with a friend one time to say, hey, when we were with all the couples and we were talking, you kind of said this about your wife, and I don't think that was the best thing to say. Like, I'm not trying to get in your business, and all of a sudden you find out that there's deeper marital things, and it was like a get back for a conversation that was had in the car on the way there. I'm like, you made us all uncomfortable. What's going on? And able to step in and show love and care. See, it's not... It's with the heart of restoration. The goal is restoration. The goal isn't to prove that I'm right and that you're wrong. The goal isn't like I'm righteous and you're not. The goal is to say, there's some tough things. How can I help restore you? The Bible says in, in Matthew 18, it's recorded that if we have a conflict or if there's sin, that we would go to a brother or a sister. We would make a conversation. And, and if it's not being heard from them, then, then guess what we do? We take someone else with us and say, hey, we want to talk. This is for restoration. It's in love. If it's not heard, then we go to the church. It doesn't mean that on a Sunday, you know, Nate gets done with the song. You're like, hey, I need the mic. I got something. I got to talk about, like, this guy over here. He's doing these things. No, it's go to the leadership. It's private. It's a, it's a safe. If we're to be a harbor, it needs to be a safe place for even hard things like this. Say, hey, we're creating safety. And at last resort, if this is a confessing Christian that's not turning from sin, it's to remove them from the church. And any church that's excited about that has got problems. Often, it never, rarely ever gets to that point within a church because sadly, the person leaves. They'll say, you know what, I don't want to turn from it. I don't want to have another conversation. I want to continue with what I'm doing. But so... Here's biblically what could and should happen and what you would desire to happen, that a conversation happens and a quick turn happens. And let's say the person is removed, that after a month or a two, or after a short period of time, even a week, 10 minutes, to say, I miss the relationship of community that I have and I had, and I want that back. And I'm sorry. I may not go to this church, but I'm going to go to a church. I just want to restore this relationship. See, if someone's walking with God and someone has a relationship with Christ, 
there's going to be that in a heart to turn from that sin. And that would be what our prayer would be. But we have to be careful in this because these are hard words to hear. And if we, if we hear them wrong or we communicate them wrong, it sounds like churches can't wait to kick people out of churches. Because that's not the case at all. Remember, this is a habitual, heinous sin. But you know what happens? We often don't say anything. We don't say anything. And it produces loose living with no advocacy. Not accountability, because that sounds like we're waiting for something to go wrong, right? But there's no advocacy for people. Or you swing the pendulum the other way, and it's like legalistic and confrontational and self-righteous and controlling. There's a balance in the middle, and Paul is saying, hey, let's let our goal be like verse 5, so that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. See, as serious as this scripture is, we have to embrace it. If we're followers of God's word, we have to look at the full word of God. And as hard as this message is to give, it's important for us to go, man, I want to restore people in a relationship with God. I want to restore their marriage. I want to restore their whatever it would be. But we're also not going, you know what, I'm looking for it in other people. Lest you be the one trying to take the dust out of someone else's eye and you have a two by four sticking out of yours. So we need to make sure our heart's in the right place in this and we're owning our own stuff. Verse number six says that you're boasting, it's not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We have to guard the purity of the church. I use that illustration about driving and stickers and stuff, but you know that we represent one another. We're loving and leading one another. We represent everything that's going on in lives and what this church means and what Christ's gospel means. But remember, this is a message for those inside the church. This isn't saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and push our standard and push our rules upon you. For those who are, don't know Christ as their Savior, they don't have the same accountability that's there. When I was a student pastor, we went to camp in Colorado one time. We had about 700 kids that came out. It was crazy. We were at uh, YMCA of the Rockies like in Estes Park. Like 4,000 people fit in that joint. We're all over the place. There's kids everywhere. And it was later one night, we get everybody back, and I see these high school kids running, and I was like, dude, they're sneaking out. They're right by our dorm, and I'm like, watch this. I had a rental car. You know, I come over, I swing the lights on, and they're like, ah. They pause. One of them's like, I'm going to get hit. And I'm like, I'm not going to hit you. I'm just going to scare you. And I was awesome. I was like, yeah. You know, and they run into the tennis courts. And I'm like, let's run into the jail. You know, they run into an enclosure. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's going down. I see them. I'm like, what church are you from? And they're like, I don't go to church. I'm like, why are you here? We're at a family reunion. I was like, oh, cool. Whose beer is that? <laughs> Grandma's. You know, it was like, they, had, they were high school kids. They got beer. And I was like, oh, so I took their beer and we left. Um, no, <laughs> got them back to grandma. But the accountability they would have had if they were with us was different than not being with us. Now, grandma had to deal with it and all that. And she probably wasn't happy that her Coors Light got ganked. But I know, I know this, that that little bit of unity breaking up in a camp and that kind of thing happened, that would have affected the entire thing. And they weren't inside, they were outside, so it was a different standard. And I didn't have to call any parents. I just dropped them off at the cabin and said, Grandma, there's, these kids are doing this, and here's your beer, right? So all that went on. Think about when it says the little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of disunity, a little bit of sin kind of coming in. It changes the dynamic of everything. See, a little bit of sin affects a whole lot of souls. A little bit of sin affects a whole lot of souls. Please act like you're writing that down. That took me a long time to put that together, okay? Just, Mike, act like you're doing something. Okay, there, yeah, he's typing it in his phone. Good, he's posting that. Um, glory to God. A little bit of sin affects a whole lot of souls. That we don't live independently. You know how yeast works? Like it takes like one, uh, it's like a, a one to an 80 ratio, like 80, 80 flour, one yeast. It, you don't take a lot of it. I got a bread maker when we got married. I think we used it three times. I'm just wondering what if we would have done like a one to one ratio, you know, I don't know what would have happened, but think about it like that. It doesn't take a lot of it. It just takes a little bit of it. So with leaven, we have to look at it and go, okay, 
if the Bible, when it refers to leaven, when it refers to yeast, it's referencing sin, and we drag that illustration in because that's the purpose of it. Leaven works in secret, and so does sin. Yeast works in secret. We don't really know how it works. We just know that the bread starts to rise. Also, leaven or yeast is revealed when the heat's turned on. So when the heat's turned on in our life, that's when that little hint, that little bit of sin reflects a bigger problem sometimes underneath. That's why when the heat is turned on in someone who's walking with Jesus and they're active, you're like, how do they have a peace? The peace that I can't even describe. It's because their foundation is firm in him. But when that sin slips in, Ephesians 5 says, but sexual morality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. Some versions say not even a hint of it. Because you know how they used to make bread. They would take part of the dough as they made the loaf. They would take part of the dough and they would let it ferment. They would eat this loaf. That would ferment. They'd make their next loaf and they'd take a piece of it off because it would ferment and it would begin to leaven and they would use that throughout the year. But guess what they did? Once a year, they'd take it all, they'd eat it all, they'd throw it all away. And that time of the year was Passover. And if sin, and I, that's why I love scripture, that's why I love the Bible, God gives us these pictures that we actually get, because I don't know if you know this, he created everything, okay? And so he gives us these things that help us understand, because what was the purpose of Passover? Passover was illustrating that there was a lamb that was going to pay for all the sins of the world, and that those who had sinned, the leaven, would be made clean. So at this time of Passover, they wouldn't just start over with the bread. They would sweep out the corners of their house. They would dust everything. They would clean everything so that there would be no leaven, no yeast, no sin in the house for the master is coming. The lamb is coming. And they are not making themselves and we are not making ourselves righteous. In just a moment, we're going to be receiving communion and the elements themselves are not making us righteous. It's the confession of sin and the preparation in our heart that purifies us before God because of what he has done for us. So as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, you're not trying to be more whole, or you're not trying to get everything out of your life so that you can attain holiness. You've been made holy by what's been done for you and I. But this leaven that exists, this sin that exists in our life, have we allowed it to make a bigger mess than what we think is actually going on? See, the problem is, is we get mixed up in what repentance looks like. We think in the way that the world repents versus the way that godly repentance. It's defined for us in 2 Corinthians 7. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So this worldly repentance, what it means is, I got caught doing these things, so I'm only going to confess these things, but there's other things that are going on. It's fueled by guilt, it's fueled by shame, it's fueled by I'm only going to let you see as much as what you've already found out. But godly repentance says, I have sinned. Not just I'm sorry, but I've sinned and I'm seeking your forgiveness. And I want to be fully known by you. That's what God wants for us. Think about the marriage that only a certain amount is found out and it's like I'm not going to tell any more than that because that's kind of good. She knows enough. He knows enough. God knows it all, so I'm probably good. It's important for all of the yeast, all of the leaven, to leave the house, to leave the life. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. See, If we take our sin casually, we will become a casualty. If we take our sin casually, we will become a casualty to that sin. Do you know why God drives sin out of our lives? Because he draws us in. He drives it out to draw us in. Clean the yeast out of the house. Get everything cleaned up because he wants, we need to make room for him because he's coming. That's what communion is about. And correction and discipline is not fun to have, right? But James tells it this way. Excuse me, Hebrews tells it this way. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. 
It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be corrected. Are you in relationships enough that you could have an honest and helpful conversation and you can encourage one another? This is a call to personal holiness. So what if, what if everyone in this room was as holy as you are? Would that be a good thing? If everyone, we got to look at ourselves. I don't say that out of guilt. I say that out of, let's be called up. Paul's calling us up. Yeah, there's some sin that's being called out, but he's calling us up. And with communion, it gives us an opportunity to stop and to reflect. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I just encourage you as we receive communion in just a moment, that you would take both cups, and they're stacked together, the bread and the juice are right there, and you would pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, remembering what he's done for you. See, when we remember well, we worship well. And when we remember what he's done for us, we can worship him for all that he is. And if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, now's an opportunity as you're going to have a few minutes to reflect, to just remember what he's done for you. To confess sin and to make right and to say, hey, I've got this hint of this. I've got a little bit of anger. I've got some things that are starting to brew in my heart and my mind. But I want to seek forgiveness for those things. And if you don't have a relationship with God and you're not looking for one, I just encourage you, you don't have to receive communion. You don't have to participate in a religious activity or some kind of tradition. It would be best if it's done from a heart that's one worshiping, the one that's worthy of our worship. So what we get to do, they're going to pass this out. I want to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes just right where you're at. But the elements will be passed by just shortly and you can take that. And I want to encourage you, we're doing it just a little bit different. I'm going to ask that you wait to receive it until I come back out and we will receive it together and we'll pray together. So it just gives you a little bit more time to reflect and, and to say, God, what is it that you want for me? What are the things that I'm, I've got some hints of some things in my life and I need some direction in that. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, uh, they'll go ahead and, and sing a song and we'll pass communion. We'll receive it together just in a moment.